Could you please make sure to uh, silence your cell phones? And uh, I just wanted to remind you one more time before we get started that uh, on Wednesday evening, we will not be having a service. So you all just relax the night before, make your pumpkin pies, whatever you're going to do, and uh, be all prepared to be with your families. So let's open up now in prayer. Lord, we just thank you that you know everything about us, more than we even know about ourselves. Every, every anxiety, every pain, emotional or physical, everything that we're going through, that you know all things. You put us here at this time, and sometimes I wonder why, really, but I know that you have a purpose and a reason for us to be here now, and we're able to know the stuff going on all over the world, and we just ask you, Lord, that we would just pray for these things, and we just ask you for your mercy and your grace and your help in these times of trouble that we live in. And we just want to thank you right now this morning and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to begin with a song. It's an old hymn. It's a favorite of mine. And it is uh, considered to be a uh, Christmas song. It's been used for that purpose. But... Actually, in a way, it's timeless, and it's related to the uh, second coming of Jesus, the second advent, and it's related also to Israel. And I'll just do one verse, I'll just say one verse from there, and it's, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here, until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. And the national anthem of the nation of Israel is called Hatikva, the hope. And uh, Israel is a nation right now, and many of its people, the Israelis, do not realize that the hope of Israel is actually their Messiah and that it is Jesus. Um, I follow on a daily basis, what's going on in the church, but also uh, in the world. And I've kind of done that uh, all of my life, as I used to watch the news on a daily basis growing up. And it was very common for uh, pretty much everybody to do that and adults to to discuss that. Um, And so it can be something that is uh, really a heavy thing, though, and, and it can be overwhelming at times. And just recently here in Israel this year, uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles that begun, began on Saturday, September 30th of September, and it ended on Friday, the 6th of October. And then there's one more day that's following that called Simhat Torah, which is the rejoicing in the Torah when they celebrate uh, God's word. And on that day, Israel was attacked. And so they are now calling that day because it was a Sabbath, because uh, it was uh, beginning the feast on the Sabbath. And then the next Sabbath, very early in the morning on Saturday, they were attacked in a very horrible way. And all the ramifications of of that was going on. But to me, the most uh, difficult thing really to deal with is uh, the hundreds of thousands of people, including those on our campuses in our country, uh, supporting Hamas. And even when a person will question them, well, you, you know about the horrible things that they, that they did to them, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, what do you say about that? Oh, well, they had it coming to them. So when you see those sort of things, that can be just very uh, grievous in itself. And so there's many Jewish believers in Israel right now that are suffering. Um, and we want to make sure to pray for those that lost friends and family members um, but also especially for those who there's almost 250 that are still uh, held hostage. And at the same time, there are born-again believers that are Jewish Israelis that are giving thanks to God for what he's doing at the same time that this situation is going on. And just, uh, just the last uh, couple of months, my wife came across the website that uh, I would suggest, I would recommend it to you. Uh, The guy that started this website, his name is Jeff, and he is uh, a born-again believer that is a Jewish Israeli. And the website is called So Be It. And uh, 
just this last week especially, I remember I come home and one says, oh, I have a couple more to show to you. And I go, oh, good, good, I really need this. But he goes down to like Tel Aviv and out on the boardwalk there uh, by the sea. And just people that are passing by and says, well, uh, will they do an interview with him? And he'll record it. And they'll, he'll say to them, he'll introduce himself and say, well, you know, I'm a Jewish person that, that believes in Jesus. You know, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? And that's how he'll start. And then he also puts uh, different testimonies on there, um, which is really encouraging because right now uh, there's been several of uh, born-again believing Israeli Jewish people that have been killed in this war. Um, but they are very, very uh, bold and outspoken, and they're praying, and the gospel is going out. And some of these soldiers are getting saved right now. So it's really good to be able to have uh, a praise report. You just call that a praise report. Um, when we got saved back in the, uh, the, the Jesus people days, it was very common to just be giving testimonies on, on a weekly basis. And it's really neat to see what God is doing. And it's really awesome to see what God is doing, even under the most horrible uh, circumstances, so we don't do that so much these days, but testimonies are very encouraging. So thanksgiving and worship, praise and joyfulness are inseparable. They go together in the scriptures. And I want to refer right now to Thessalonians 5, verse 18. Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. For you. Now, we need to take notice, though, that it does not say to be thankful for everything, but rather to be thankful in everything. Whatever situation that we were going through, whether it's good or bad, we are to be thankful to God. Now, for the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel at the time of Jesus, Passover took place at the first month of the year. That's where the year began, not the way it is now, but rather at the time of Passover in the spring. That was the beginning of the, their year. Then there were the other holidays that took place at that same time in the spring. Then there would be a long, dry summer. And then at the end of the summer, there was the celebrations that came in the fall. In the seventh month came the last feast of the year, the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is called the Feast of Joy, and it is the last feast of the year on ancient Israel's calendar. And I want to, I want to say that, I want to emphasize that, because Tishri is, uh, it it's, would be considered to be their religious calendar uh, now, but their ancient calendar, that was their calendar, and it was a, a lunar calendar. And so that would be the celebration that came at the very end of the year. And they would, they would go kind of like what uh, Pastor Chuck had done in Calvary Chapel, to go through the whole Bible, verse by verse, from Genesis all the way to the end uh, at Revelation. But it might take several years. Well, for the Tanakh, the Old Testament, they did that. And they had a daily reading or daily portion. And uh, at this time... Uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, they would conclude their scriptural reading for that year. And then on the, uh, the eighth day, because that's New Beginnings, um, then they would start over again and begin the scripture reading going for the whole rest of the year. And on Yom Kippur, as a nation, their sins had been forgiven because when the high priest went in, he was doing something that was uh, a forgiveness of sins for the whole nation, which is separate from individuals bringing uh, you know, a bull or goat or whatever is necessary for their own private, personal, individual sins, the high priest would go in there then for the whole nation. And there was a great relief and a sense of joy. And then came the 15th of Tishri, the joy of the Feast of Tabernacles. To be thankful for God's material provi provisions is important, but to have joy... Because of the cross and God's provision for salvation is the greatest joy of all. And even this morning, the, the worship songs were just absolutely perfect for me. It was just reminding me of these things. And I was thinking of uh, Ephesians. Uh, it's in chapter 1, 
and verse 3 says, We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And it says also that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So I'd like to first turn to now 1 Corinthians at uh, chapter uh, 2. 1 Corinthians 2 at verse 9. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Now, there was a fulfillment of this at that time when the Messiah came and Jesus was there and taught the people, and then when he left and he gave the Holy Spirit, that was a fulfillment of that. But there still is a future, a future fulfillment of this, and that would be when we come with the Lord Jesus Christ and again back into this world after God's judgment is done, and the wonderful and marvelous things that will be happening in the kingdom uh, with Jesus for a thousand years, but then also uh, in heaven. And if we were to be taken by the Lord today, or when we're going to be snatched out here in the rescue, we would then be in the presence of the Lord, and we would then be able to have a glimpse of those things that are coming. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, at verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. That's speaking about Lord Jesus Christ and how he knows everything about us. He knows even more about us than we know about ourselves. And there will be that day when we'll be with the Lord and we'll be fully known okay and so also i'd like to then change pay now we cannot fully understand it now but then there will come a time when we will we have been so conditioned in our culture to think about earthly blessing we can end up treating lightly the spiritual blessing that we have now and what is to come. Now, it's very important to be thankful just for our daily lives, and I certainly am. Um, I'm having a really hard time at work right now, big difficulties, but then it's reminded to me, um, a number of years back, I lost my job in 2009, and it took several years before I got a a job again, and then um, at that time, I got a virus in my ear several months after I lost my job, and I lost my hearing in one ear. I had vertigo, And I've always had chronic back pain. And so I really thought, am I ever going to be able to work again? What is going to happen? I ended up living with relatives. And I was really not knowing, you know, what to do and and what would come of that. And then so when I was able to actually, through a temp agency, then get work. And then after a few more years to be able to get hired at the company I'm at now, the Lord just reminds me when things are going really rough at work. You, know, well, you remember, you know, you, you asked for this job? And I go, oh, oh, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. I need to be thankful that I can even be able to work. And I need to be thankful that I was able to get hired at a company again. And, uh, and, and then not only that, but just to be able to be here uh, with these people that I'm working with, um, they, they really need to have a light that's shining in a dark place, and, and they need to know you. So it's not just that I'm here to do a job and, you know, uh, earn a living and take care of us, but the Lord has me there for a specific reason. So it's important to be thankful for those things, but we can be in a situation where, uh, like many of our brothers and sisters throughout the Lord, you end up in a prison or something like that, and you, you know, you don't have a job, and you don't even have, you know, a life compared to what people would think of in this country as having a life, and you're in miserable conditions. And then at that time, you're stripped of everything, and then you can just truly think about that you have the Lord Jesus Christ and the spiritual blessings and in the future and what he has for us. So, uh, you know, those sort of things can, can, can help you to be thankful for the spiritual uh, blessings. Now, I'd like to turn to Revelation uh, chapter 21. Chapter 
chapter 21, starting at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Now we see in the Gospel of John at chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh, and dwelt, which is tabernacled, dwelt among us. So if you remember in the 14th chapter, then Jesus was saying, I'm going to leave you now. And they were very grieved. And he's saying, but don't let your heart be troubled because I'm going to prepare a place for you and I will come back. But still, he was with them for such a short time. The Messiah they had looked forward to coming, but they thought he was going to rule and reign. They didn't know he was going to leave. So they were grieved, but he's telling, I'll be with you again. And here we see that God is going to dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. In the future, we will be with the Lord Jesus in his kingdom for a thousand years and forevermore, and we'll never be separated. So I want to continue now on verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Although we have these awesome descriptions of heaven and in the Bible, if you want to really capture the spirit of rejoicing of what heaven is, it's in the Feast of Tabernacles. There is a spirit of rejoicing in the feast that captures what you've got now and where you're going. So I want to look now to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. At verse 15, Acts chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Now, this was the day of Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out, and then there were those persons that were mocking and uh, uh, concerning that and saying they were drunk and so forth. And Peter stands up. And he begins to preach in his sermon. And in verse 15, he says, For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. So when the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost, it was not just the Spirit only, but the Spirit with the Word of God. Because look, he says here, but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Then the next several verses is quoting in Joel. He's showing to them that that is being fulfilled. Because we have going on today, what they're saying is that the Spirit gives life, but the letter kills. And they're talking, they're referring to God's Word. Okay? And that they're saying to be spiritual is to go by the Spirit, follow the Spirit, be moved by the Spirit. But if you're going to talk about doctrine and talk about the Word of God, then that's going to quench the Spirit. And so I just want to say here that the Word, and don't forget, but Jesus is the Word become flesh and dwelled among us. And not only that, but the whole Scriptures, all of it, is God-breathed. It was given to us by the Holy Spirit. So when Peter begins to speak, he says, What you see happening was foretold in the Word of God, 
Whatever is said to be from the Holy Spirit must agree with the Word of God. It's the Word of God and Spirit together. They are inseparable. So I want to look also at Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Then, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. There is no true revival that can take place without repentance. And I've been told by persons lately that repentance is not necessary, and I have individuals that are really upset with me over that issue. And in a few days, I'm going to be getting together with family members. And so please pray for me because uh, I haven't been back together with them since uh, I, I got in trouble for saying that. So um, Lynn and I are, are hoping to be able to get together with our family uh, peacefully <laughs> in a few days from now. And then in verse 20, And that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, now, realize this. Jesus has already come, and now he has left. And now he's preaching this and sending so that they may send Jesus appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So now he's talking about all things being fulfilled and that that concerning when Jesus would be coming back in his second coming. So Jesus has already come, and he died for the, for the sins, but now it will be the, the uh, restoration of all things. And that is ushered in with the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I'm going to look later into John chapter 7, where Jesus is going to appear in this feast. But why did Jesus appear in the middle of the feast in John chapter 7 and then declare himself to be everything that was needed? Is because he was and he is the fulfillment of that feast. So I look, to look also at Joel chapter 2, verse 23. So rejo rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain as before. So when we just looked into uh, the second chapter of Genesis, we saw there that the Holy Spirit was being poured out. And so Peter stood up to, to preach and to teach from Joel about what that was about. And that was a fulfillment of that, but it's not the only fulfillment of that. And so it's speaking about the former rain and the latter rain. So that would be considered the former rain, the outpouring of the Spirit that took place on the day of Pentecost. So let's look at uh, Joel 2, verse 24 and 25. The threshing floor will be full of grain, and the vats will overflow with the new wine and oil. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust and the stripping locust and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. We can see the physical rain, but what does spiritual rain look like? Let's, let's look at Hosea now that goes with this as well. Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2. I'm sorry. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up. On the third day. And remember also in the New Testament that we're told 
that a day is as a thousand years to God, and a thousand years is, is as a day. So let's keep that in mind here as we go to verse number three. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. The former and the latter rain in Israel. Um, I was speaking uh, about the feasts that take place that are in the spring there. And then you have uh, the harvest time that comes at that time at the beginning of the summer. But then you have a long, dry summer. And then you have the feasts once again at the end of the summer. And Pentecost was the beginning of the church at the beginning of the summer. And prophetically speaking, there's 2,000-year period of time that's taking place. And much of that time was very dry. But in Israel, although there is the rain that takes place uh, at the springtime, and then there is again in the fall, in Israel, there always is dew. And the dew is there to sustain you during that time between there, between that time and now. Now, I know that many people are wanting to see a great revival. And that's a great big thing that's going on in the church right now and constantly paying uh, for revival. But as the way that I see it, that there is the apostasy going on right now, and it is not to the degree that it will be when the Antichrist comes, but that's going on right now. Um, and the, we had a great revival that took place here in the time of the, uh, the 60s and the Jesus people. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever see that again. But there are individual places like in Europe and in uh, Britain where like 20 years ago there was an outpouring amongst the gypsies only. And a lot of people don't know about that. But they got the gospel and they stuck with the gospel and they did not depart from that. And uh, they have not become uh, you know, cold uh, in their love for the Lord. Um, and they still are sticking with the gospel. And there will be different places. There will be individuals' lives. There will be different um, people that God touches. And that's why I was referring also to what's going on in Israel, because there is a moving in Israel right now and amongst Jewish people, and that could be even also Jewish people here as well, not only in Israel. Now, in John chapter 7, we can see that the Feast of Tabernacles teaches us that this is available to us right now in our personal lives. It is available to us to, to, to tap into on a daily basis, okay, just to live these lives, just day by day. That is available to us right now. Now, the church began with the Jews and it ends with the Jews as God is turning his attention back to them. And Israel was desolate and wandering the whole earth for 2,000 years, but is now being regathered to her land, and the spiritual rain is beginning to fall. But how do we know that it is not only for the Jews, but the Feast of Tabernacles is for everybody, the Jews, and also for the nations? So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16 at verse 13. You shall celebrate the Feast of Booths seven days after you have gathered in from your threshing floor and your wine vat, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants and the Levite and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your towns. And notice it says, you shall rejoice in your, in your feast. So it's hard to us to relate to now because, you know, we can just go to get the, to the grocery store and all except for during the time of COVID, pretty much you could go there and everything's there. 
And it comes from South America, whether it's bananas or whatever. It comes from different countries. And so it's all there waiting for us at any time. So it is hard for us to relate to the seasons and the harvest and when things are available at a certain time and the land and those things that Jesus uh, used parables to speak about with the agriculture and, and the land. And God would set a certain time that they were to come together and to be rejoicing. And that was at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they were to come before the Lord and they were to rejoice whether things were good or whether things were bad. That was a time to be thankful and a time to rejoice. As this week is coming up here and Thanksgiving's coming, I was praying this last few days and I was being thankful, uh, although my heart was heavy for the things that are going on. At the same time, still, I was rejoicing and I was giving thanks. Now, when... Okay, I want to read. Okay, now I want you to see right here that it says the stranger. So you have your female servants and your Levite and your stranger. Now, the stranger was representing the Gentiles, the Gentile people of the world. And so this is a feast that is for the Jews and it is also for the Gentiles. When Solomon was going to dedicate the temple that he had built because his father David wanted to be able to build it but wasn't able to, and that assignment then was given to him, and when he was going to do the dedication of that temple, he chose for the time to dedicate it, the Feast of Tabernacles. So I want to look at that in First Kings, in First Kings uh, 8, at verse 41, First Kings 8, 41. Also concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, when he comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm when he comes and prays towards this house. Now, there's this, this is a long prayer that he's giving in dedication to the temple, and so we're just, we're just going right into the middle of it. And this is... King Solomon's prayer of dedication, and he understood at this Feast of Tabernacles that it was for the people of every nation that would come and visit. It wasn't for his people only. So I'd like to turn also to Numbers chapter 29. Now, I just want to show you where this is. I'm not going to read it, okay? But this is where it's coming from here. And I want to refer also to Genesis of chapter 10. In Genesis chapter 10, it's known as the Table of Nations. And it's there where you can see that there are 70 nations. And so 70 nations represent all the nations of the world. And the Jewish people, in their mind, there were 70 nations. And so I want you to look here where it is what's going on here is it's des describing the feast, starting with the first day and going through this to the seventh day. And so each day, it meticulously describes each and every sacrifice that is to take place on each day, day by day. But what's really interesting and I went through it one day. <laughs> I went through it one day for like about an hour because I wanted to see for myself. I heard it was true, but I wanted to see, is there really 70 bulls? So there, there's different numbers of bulls that are uh, sacrificed each day. But when you get down to the seventh day and it concludes, there has been 70 bulls that have been sacrificed during that time. And it has represented not just Israel, but it's also representing the 70 nations or all the different peoples of the world. So I would like to look now at John, chapter 12. John, chapter 12, 
verses 12 and 13. Now, this is at the, fe- the Feast of Passover. And so Jesus is getting the re- ready to go in now to the feast. And at verse 12, it tells us, On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And after that happened, the religious leaders were really upset. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. So they're plotting. They're plotting to kill Jesus, but they're also plotting to kill Lazarus as well. So just before the feast, Jesus is entering in uh, on the donkey. And the crowd took up palm branches and they went out to meet him. They were doing something that goes together and is in the Feast of Tabernacles. But this was Passover. And the people were making a mistake because of their expectation of Jesus to be able at that time to rule and to reign on the throne of David. And they were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, but at the time of Passover. But actually, if you look at the whole picture of the whole Bible from Genesis up to Revelations and what is in Revelations, you see that they are related to each other and there's actually a connection there. So let's go look in Revelations at chapter 7, verse 9. This is a scene in heaven which John was brought there to see and to witness it. And then he's describing it to us now. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. Now, if you go back, if you're going to look in Chronicles and it gives more details and more information about what was going on at the time of the dedication of the temple in the Feast of Tabernacles, when King Solomon was doing the dedication, he did so many sacrifices that they could not even be numbered. And then they couldn't even see what they were doing when the glory of the Lord came to fill in the temple And once it came in there, it would be maybe like today if we're driving to work and we get in such a thick fog, we can't even see where we're going. So we're told that in the the description of what happened at that time. And we can see here that there are so many Gentiles that they cannot be numbered. And then so Jesus has fulfilled the sacrificial system at the time this takes place. And their sins have been dealt with. And they're celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles at the throne room in heaven at this time. So in verse 10, And they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. That took place. And it took place at the time of Passover when Jesus was here. At verse 11 And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And this is the kingdom song that is being expressed in here. And at verse 13, Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in white robes, 
Who are they, and where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So that hasn't happened yet. That's up before us, and it's just on the horizon, and it's during the last seven years, the 70th week of Daniel. And it is the point at which we get snatched out of here, if we're still here. Okay, If we're here, at that point, we'll get snatched out of here. And it is people from all over the whole world, every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, and every nation. I don't know if you guys know who the guy is. His name is, he goes by the son of Hamas. And he wrote a book. Uh, there is a video, there's a movie called The Green Prince. And he is, uh, he, he was Muslim, and he is Arab, what people call Palestinian. He was Arab, and his dad helped to found Hamas. And um, he was in prison and ended up seeing horrible, horrible things going on inside that prison of the Hamas uh, torturing and killing uh, other Hamas people, thinking that they were uh, spying when they weren't. And he was very young. He was a teenager. And his heart was very troubled over that. And he ended up actually, after some time, helping out the Jewish people. Then he got to a point where if they didn't get him out of there, maybe he was going to get killed. And so I think it was in 2009. I remember we in our Bible study were actually praying for him uh, in San Diego because this is where he he took place. He ended up in San Diego. He, He was able to get into the country temporarily, but... He was trying to get asylum here because he would be killed if he was brought back. And I remember uh, Obama was the president at the time, and they were going to send him back. He was going to be killed. Now, what happened is the person who was his handler that was Jewish and an Israeli got on a plane and flew here because his hearing was that day in the San Diego court. And that guy, um, really people were upset with him in Shimbit for, for doing that. And, and he had been fired. He ended up getting fired because he became friends with this guy. And you're not supposed to do that. That is definitely against his policy. But he had made friends with him. And he was willing to come here and to testify in the court. And I remember at the time, his testimony saved Yosef's life because the judge decided not to extradite him. And uh, to, I want to add on top of that, that when he was here in San Diego, he was very, very distraught. And he didn't know what to do. He was homeless. He didn't have a home. He didn't know anybody. And I don't know if somebody invited him or exactly the details, but he got together with some, uh, uh, they were Arab believers, and he became born again and came to know the Lord as his Savior. So God is working mightily in the horrible circumstances that are going on. Uh, We can pray for those persons that are there whether they be called Palestinian or whatever, for them to be saved, to repent of their sins, to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and for the Jewish people uh, as well. And in verse 15, For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. The sun is going to scorch people on the face of the earth at that time. Verse 17, For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So in the booths they would leave room so that When they would look up, they could be able to see the stars at night. The sun would beat on them, and it could remind them of that time of their fathers uh, in the wilderness. Now, they will have a tabernacle to be spread over them. Remember that Jesus tabernacled for a short time when he came to this earth. But from now on, he will be with them forevermore. And this, as we see here on the last verse, he will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs 
of water of life. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And that is Mein Haim in Hebrew. That's the living water, the water of life, as Jesus speaks of in John chapter 7. So let's look at Leviticus 23. Leviticus number 23 at verse 39. Now, is what these are is the, uh, the specifications of how you're going to worship. So on verse 39, on exactly the 15th day of the seventh month, that's the month of Tishri, when you have gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. The feast begins on the Sabbath day, and then it goes until Friday, and then it's completed on Friday. But then on the next day, there's another Sabbath, and that's the eighth day, the day of new beginnings, and that's what they call Simhat Torah. And I don't know if you've ever seen, have you ever seen the rabbis like dancing around with the Torah and all that? Uh, the scrolls, they'll be dancing around with the scrolls. That's what that's about. That's Simhat Torah, that's the um, rejoicing in the Torah. In verse 40, Now on the first day you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, for seven days. Now, we don't know what it's like to reap in a specific season of the year. We have everything at our fingertips. It's instant. We need to be patient with God for everything to be within its season. That's what this is showing us here. And in Leviticus uh, 23, verse 40, in Revelation chapter 7, they take the palm branches and are rejoicing before the Lord. They are celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in heaven from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. They would wave the branches uh, in all four directions of the compass to represent the blessings to all the Gentile nations. In verse 41, you shall thus celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall sh celebrate it in the seventh month. And it will be celebrated also even in the millennial kingdom. Now in verse 42, you shall live in booths for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So when I was growing up, I really, really loved to go camping out in the desert. And it was just really neat time to get away. And the stars were absolutely amazing. I mean, now I, I go to work in the dark in the morning, I see one bright star in the moon. It's probably the planet Venus. It's probably not even a star. Um, but just to see God's awesome creation. But this was to, um, to give thanks for God's provision for the harvest, but also to remind them of what had God had done for them in the time that the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. But I want to say this also, that all of the Canaanite nations that surrounded them, they also celebrated the harvest as well. But the problem was that they were giving thanks to their pagan gods. So it's not just about God's provision as they were in the wilderness, but it's also about being, as you see here, redeemed from Egypt. It's about being set free from Pharaoh. It's about being set free from sin and Satan. 
There's the old covenant way, and there's the new covenant way. So I'd like to look at uh, John chapter 7, verse 2, where Jesus goes up to the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, John 7 at verse 2. Now the feast of Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now, these days we live in, we're living in a time of self-promotion. And people want to get their face out there on Facebook, but then also, you know, whether it's a ministry or or churches or something like that, it's it's promoting. You know, you want to get yourself out there. You want people to know. You want to be known. So that's what they are saying to him. His brothers did not even believe in him. But they're saying, hey, look, you know, if you're Messiah... And so forth. If you are who you say you are, come up to the feast. Now it's the perfect time. You know, you need to present yourself. You need to be out there and show yourself. And verse 5, verse 5 and 6, For not even his brothers were believing in him. So Jesus said to them, My time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. So the time for their pl- uh, blessing, the time for their promotion was something that was always opportune. And he was saying to them that although your time is opportune and you're going to do what you decide to do, I cannot. I have to do what I do according to what my Father tells me. And at the time that he tells me to do it, I need to do always what my Father is telling me to do. At verse 8, Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet come. And then there's this exchange that's going on between uh, Jesus and the, and the people. And then also I think the uh, religious leaders are involved in this. And they're, deb- they're debating with him. And I want to come up to uh, verse 33 here. Therefore, Jesus said... For a little while longer I am with you. Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? Well, Actually, in a way, the answer is, is yes. Because for that 2,000-year period of time, Jesus went to the Gentiles throughout the whole world, starting with Paul as he was the apostle that went to the Gentiles. And so for that 2,000-year period of time, Jesus was going to the Gentiles as the uh, church was uh, do- dominated by Gentiles. In verse 36... What is this statement that he said, You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Then we come to the last and the great day of the feast. And there were um, priests, and they divided the priests up into three groups. Um, And one would go down, and they would get... uh, uh, in the Kidron Valley, they would get these huge 25-foot willows. And there was a procession that was leading up toward uh, the altar. And they'd wave the willows. And it made this swishing sound as they were approaching. And it was understood by them that that swishing sound was representing the moving of the Holy Spirit as Jesus used that uh, example of the wind you know, that you, that it's going here, it's going there. You, you, you know where it's going. You can feel it and so forth like that, but you can't actually see it. And that is a description of the Holy Spirit. 
And then there was another group. They divided them into uh, thirds. And so another group would uh, take a golden bowl and they would go down to the pool of Siloam and they'd fill it up with the water and they would take it up then to the altar and they would end up uh, to pour it out, representing the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And then there was a third group that was preparing and then they were going to do all of the sacrifices. And then those that had the willows would bring them up to the altar and then they'd put them on the two sides of the altar and curved like this and so they'd go up like that and then come together over the altar and then it would uh, be the same as like if you see the Jewish wedding and there's a hoopah going up. So it's like he prepares his banquet for me and his banner over me is love. So that was com- combined with there too, like, like as if it was a, a, a wedding combined it, with it. And then... Uh, the only thing I can think about it maybe is like we have here with Pasadena, uh, the Rose Parade. It comes once a year. And if you hear them talking about the floats and so forth, it's, it's no little thing. It's really huge. It's, uh, what they do is they go all year long. As soon as one's over, they start preparing then for the next one. And it's taken the whole year. So this ceremony was very meticulous, and the preparation for it had been going on since the time of the Passover. And to them, it was just like a really big deal. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, this guy who's an itinerant preacher, he steps up and he interrupts at this very important point in the feast. He interrupts the whole thing. And we see this in verse 37. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me, and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now to them, that would have sounded like it was blasphemous. And think about it. He is either a liar, or he's a lunatic, he's lost it, or he is exactly who he really is declaring himself to be, the source of everything that all people need, and he's declaring himself to be God. And in verse 39, we see, But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Spirit was given the source of our joy in our lives as we see the gifts of the Spirit described to us in the fifth chapter of Galatians. Then you come to the whole, uh, the, the eighth chapter is what's going on is that Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives and then early the next morning he came again into the temple and all the people were coming into him and he sat down and began to teach. So you have the seven days of the feast, and the feast is completed then on Friday, but then on the next day, on Saturday, on the Sabbath, it's the eighth day, which is representing the day of new beginnings. And this is where they had uh, devised this trap for him that they really thought was going to be working by bringing the woman caught in adultery. And then he goes down to the ground and he writes, okay, he writes on the ground. That's exactly what you see in in Genesis when Torah was given, when the law was given that God wrote with his finger on the tablets. And so when he's done with this situation here, he tells the woman to go and to sin no more. This is the preparation now. The Holy Spirit is going to be given. There's going to be the new covenant. And and so in the eighth chapter, in the day of new beginnings, when the Jewish people, if you ever see it, and uh, the rabbis are there, and they're dancing all around with the Torah and so forth like that. It's the joy in celebrating the Torah. But they're thinking more specifically maybe of just the law. But think of it as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And I don't know if you know this, but the way, the way is what they called the Torah. That was another name for it, Torah. So it's like him saying, I am the Torah and the life and the truth. No man comes to the Father but by me. And as we saw in John, in chapter 1 of verse 14, it says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so we see Jesus here, and we see the Word of God, and we see the Spirit all together in this situation on the eighth day that they celebrated back then 
But now we can celebrate it looking forward to the millennium and to being with him forever and um, not only for what he did when he came the first time. So I want to conclude by looking back at uh, in Zechariah. Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14 at verse 9. Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. Then at verse 16, Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem, because just prior to this, it's the battle of Armageddon, and all the nations of the world will come against Israel, against the Jewish people. The Antichrist will be involved in that, and then Jesus will come at just the right time and destroy the Antichrist without any battle. They will be destroyed, and he will rescue his people. So Judah, all, Judah also, I mean, I'm sorry, where am I? Yeah. Judah also will fight in Jerusalem, and the wealth of the surrounding nations will be gathered, gold, silver, uh, garments, and in great abundance. Uh, verse 16. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. <clears throat> And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. If the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. <clears throat> So there will still be the nations. Those that Jesus allows to continue will be in the millennial kingdom. And the Lord Jesus will be ruling on the throne of David with a rod of iron. And we will be ruling with him. And the nations will go up each year to worship at Jerusalem. <coughs> Lord, we just want to thank you for your word, for the spirit you have given. And for Jesus and for what we can be grateful for right now and for in the future. In Jesus' name, amen.